Welcome everybody to the weekly probate mastery group coaching call. I don't really have anything prepared for this week. These conversations tend to pick up their own theme and we roll with it and had some really productive calls the last few. So don't be shy. Step in. Eric Stark, buddy, I'm sorry. I missed you. I did not get to your side of Michigan. I'm in the UP now. Good for you. <laughs> you swing back down this way, stop on it, man. I'm not jealous. And I, I did get your message and I will give you a call to discuss that. Awesome. Thank you. What'd you work on this week? I'm just going through and finishing up some branding, getting the revisions and perfect edits on the book so we can start mailing those to the people that uh, are in the hot areas where we want to buy more properties. We're just going to start mailing a copy of the book right to people. Just trying to perfect some more processes, get the website and really just trying to find out how all of the colleagues are really picking up traction. We're only connecting to about 15 to 18% of the people. And we're just getting shot down at every angle. Like we've got it covered. I think the one thing that I just have to figure out is we've got to find that way to become benevolently more bold with these people. It seems like we're providing value. We're helping clean out their house. And the next thing I know is somebody else stepped in and has bought it from underneath us when they've been adamant about saying, we don't really know what we're doing yet. So I'm just trying to find that perfect line to walk that is not pressing too hard, but being bold enough to, uh, you know, to step right into that. Have you pressed too hard? Have you found that boundary? You know, the only time I've really felt that I pressed too hard is when I get cussed out and they say, you know, my, my family just passed away and you're over here trying to press me and get us to make a decision on something that, you know, the attorney told us we have to wait the four month period for. And I think I've mentioned this before. It seems like anything shy of 30 days, they think their attorney is a godsend to the situation. But once they cross that 30 to 45 day mark, they're like, man, this guy really isn't doing or communicating anything to us. You've actually told us more than he has, you know, and then we try to push for the appointment. They're like, well, we're still just kind of waiting. And then the next time we follow up, they're like, yeah, we went under contract and uh, we closed Friday. Have you closed one of these deals with one of those people who realized the attorney wasn't going to do everything <clears throat> and eventually came and did, they did business with you? So I haven't closed on a probate since back in the beginning of March. I mean, we're doing really well with the driving for dollars, but the probate is really, it's really having a hard time right now for us. Okay, so let's go back to the ones you found driving for dollars. Do you still have a relationship with the seller? Would they jump on a Zoom call with you? Absolutely, yes, they love what we've done for them. So here's what I wanna try. I want you to get them on your calendar and do a Zoom call and record everything. We're gonna edit it down to a reel. But let's get each of those sellers to come on a Zoom call, talk about their experience up until the point that you called and then after you called. And okay. consider the whole thing be real. We're not going to use it in long form, but we want to get the whole story out there and get that laid out in be real. We're going to give those to a good video editor. And we're going to have them put it into a highlight reel that's two to three minutes. And okay. every time you speak to somebody where you are backing off and someone else is getting to them before you, your next contact, following each of those conversations where you feel like you need to back off, you're going to drop that and say, listen, I, I completely understand how you feel. It's one of the big reasons we do this because a lot of people put too much faith in, in the attorney thinking they're going to deal with things outside of the scope of, of their responsibility. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to send you a, just a, a quick little video from two or three families right here in Michigan that we help so you can see how their story played out. Would that be all right? And can I get your email? Yeah. And when you're having that, that phone call, drop that to as many people as you can. Prominently display it on your webpage. Put it on your Facebook page if you have one for the brand. I mean, if those people would be willing to do that, let's tell the story, right? The prospects who don't think they need your help need to identify with the ones who ultimately learned they did need your help. And they can either do that over a 30 to 45 day period of procrastination and frustration, or maybe we can help them accelerate that in a two to three minute video. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that definitely won't be difficult for me. The other Great thing idea. is taking the exact same concept and just putting it in writing. And you could have a follow-up letter that you drop to people, or it could just be part of your normal direct mail sequence where you say, here's a story about the Joneses. And, you know, you guys heard me tell the story about Pam and, and the beginning of probate mastery. I've told that story to so many sellers. I recycle every deal becomes a story that I use to help people be, to have more social proof and help people get comfortable with me. And, and the idea is to get them to identify as the main character in that story, right? The personal representative that you help, the one that's on camera, the one that, that you present in the first sentence of an email that you send. 
you could even run this as a, you know, as a Facebook ad. You could get that highlight reel, put an overlay, like a black bar above them and say families in Michigan talk about their experience going through probate or something like that and just run it to your audience, like create a saved audience and run that as an ad. So there's a lot of ways we can use the content. If you can get it captured, uh, then, you know, we can repurpose it in several ways. Beautiful. Yes, I can definitely do that. I'll put that on, uh, on my list to follow with those people this week. Tomorrow, actually. Dan McCarthy, making any headway over there? Uh, hi, Chad. How are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm getting some leads from my, my probate mailings. I am actually did a little bit of work on a condo that I got through a probate mailing, and we've got, I've got that sold as... There wasn't enough money in it to, to buy it myself and fix it up and sell it or wholesale it. There just wasn't enough margin there. So I, I listed it for them and, um, it was a tough situation. It was a only child passed away. The parents are devastated. They just walked away from it. They just, they went and got his diploma and walked away from it. And I kind of took care of everything for, her. so, you know, it's just listening to what you said. Uh, to Eric, I believe about, you know, creating a highlights reel uh, for YouTube or something, or just to sh show, you know, prospective clients, what you can do for them, because we actually did a lot of work on that condo. That's a something I'm going to do, I think with that owner, because she loves me now. And she was really worried about working with me. And she actually said to me on the phone the other day, she said, listen, somehow I picked you through the grace of God. And I know I made the right pick because you've helped me so much. So I'm sure I could get her to sit down and do a, you know, like a quick interview or just a, you know, a little sizzle reel kind of thing. Um, Definitely do that. I challenged Rosie with this. Hell, it's been a year ago. I think it was probably last summer. I'll always do the same challenge. If you don't have three amazing testimonials that you're proud to share with anyone and everyone, prospects, peers, you know, people in this group, if you don't have those, that should be a priority. The nice side effect of that is you're going to get paid on three deals. But the, the priority is to capture the story. Most real estate professionals go out there and they're like, oh, me, I got this certification or I got this and look at my brand. And these, these are the best headshots ever. I paid like $175, something to be aware of. Nobody gives a shit about your business. What they give a shit about is their pain going away. And if we can give them content from our business with our brand that helps them identify with that character in that story, who ultimately is the hero who got help, right? or you're the hero, they're the recipient. But if we can get them to connect with our past clients, that's some of the best marketing and the best currency we could ever have in our business. So Rosie's done a good job bringing video into her business. Eric, I think we'll get this done. Dan's going to get this done. Dave Gwen, I know you've got a ton of past clients. If you haven't done this yet, man, you, you got to get started. But for everybody on this call, if we can get those video testimonials and go long form, we can always clip it down and, and make an edited reel. But how powerful is that when someone comes to your website to check you out? And here's something. So I used WordPress Jetpack on a simple landing page that I had. So in my PS line of my letter, it's PS, if you're not ready to talk, we understand. Go to, you know, this domain to learn more. What I found is that every hundred mailers I sent would put about 60 unique web visits on that page the day the mail hit. And day one we would get 60% of people to go from a letter to a page because they were trying to learn more about me. Who is this guy? Is he a scammer or is he who he says he is? What can he really do for me? So imagine if you can, if we're getting that kind of response and, but it's not becoming an inbound lead, why is that? Where are we coming up short? So imagine if that, that traffic lands on a page where you have those stories being told. Hey, you know, my name is Sue Jones and, and I worked with Dan McCarthy about three months ago. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you what a shitty situation I was in and what Dan did to help us out. And immediately they're going to identify with that person and they're going to step into that role, that character role in that story. And it doesn't mean everyone's going to call you and do business right now, but it's going to be so much easier to build trust. And it, it's a very big differentiator. And Rosie, I'd like to hear where you're at in this since it's been about a year, but I want to issue the same challenge to everybody, like get three rock solid video testimonials. 
that we can use in your Facebook, on your Facebook page, on your YouTube channel, on your website, on landing pages and direct mail campaigns. Let's get that those done and create a highlight reel and use it in a lot of places because this is the work that's not necessarily that hard, that difficult once you've gotten the business, but it, it's work that hardly anyone will do. So it, it's easy to compete when you have things like this because nobody else is doing the work. So Rosie, since we had this conversation for you a year ago, tell us about your, your video journey and what it's been like getting clients to do it, how you use it. What advice can you offer? Uh, hi, hi everyone. I'm from Austin, Texas. And I was uh, listening to the beginning of the call. I personally have very similar challenges where investors are reaching out and the mailer to the probate leads were a little bit heavier. So to distinguish myself out of the crowd was very important. So one of the biggest successes we had is rather than just doing just a normal email campaign, whatever recordings of attorneys we did with interviews or whatever good job we did in any of the properties that we help people clean up, we made small videos of it and we embedded them into the video campaign to all our leads. I personally actually closed a listing out of it. It was never a phone call. It was just an email exchange. She met me. It took me three months of campaigning with her and she wouldn't take my call, but re respond to emails and we listed and sold the property. And it's actually one of our own investors who bought it. So he's going to be flipping it. We'll sell it again. So as Chad was saying that if we think it through properly, then we can actually score more than one listing out of it. And it was basically out of the video campaigns that I've been sending to people. You just don't have to make it perfect. Just do it. When there's no, no competition, as Chad is saying, anything you do is going to be great because there's nothing to compare to. Uh, so that has been a big advantage for us. There's no content on probate and whatever little content we put out there, people appreciated it because it looked like all the content. Another thing I have also, my challenge was that the person I'm selling probate for, they're remote. You know, kids are like five hour drive and I'm selling their property here that they inherited from their parents. So my way to get video for her was a little difficult. She wouldn't get on Zoom. I can sense the hesitancy in her voice. So we actually got a voice testimonial from her. So my team is actually putting like probate and the property address on it and our logo and everything. So they're going through editing and uh, it's just a voice testimonial and we will type out the voice recording at the bottom to make it a video content. Uh, you know, those little bars that show up when somebody's talking. So they're doing something like that. I'm not, my team does it. So we'll definitely share that product on that. What are the ways you plan to use that and repurpose? We are actually going to put it on our Facebook. We are going to put it on our YouTube channel. For our probate series, we have a different look uh, for our main banner, our main thumbnail than our other content. So when people go to our channel, they can easily uh, locate the probate content. And we plan on sending it into our final introduction emails. Um, so I have a template email for our realtor introduction when a lead converts and it has a link of those testimonials in it. And I only have one video and one half voice recording. People like, they look you up. It's easy for them to trust you when they see you. Yep. And that's it. Rosie, can you talk about that vi this video campaign you're talking about? Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? So um, whenever I did the beginning, when I started the probate group uh, with y'all, the very first assignment I think everybody was given was to interview the probate attorneys. So I located good three probate attorneys who were willing to jump on a Zoom call with us. And uh, we recorded that interview and I had our admin team write transcript of it, which means write a blog on it, on what we're really talking about. I think David Pennell was the one who told me to make it small segments and uh, from you guys as well, Chad. Um, so what we went ahead and did is come up with four minute clips of those interviews and repurpose that content and just blog with those little five minute, four minute content pieces. So I have like around 12 step campaign that kind of finishes in two to three months, two months at, at the max, I believe. The frequency is high in the beginning, then it slows down. And after that, it's just once a month, slow touch with them. Um, so it's just the interview, three attorneys, they all talk all different stuff on the same questions. So you have plenty of content and get it edited into small pieces and write blogs and just put it into any CRM that you have or and now you have video content as marketing. So it's like a MailChimp or constant contact uh, email that you send out. It's a little bit of a blog with an embedded video. It's like a YouTube icon. You click on it, it takes yeah. you to YouTube. Yeah. Okay. And you're sending those out to who? To people who are on your probate list, the emails? It Everyone. It's because probate list is going to take time to validate me. But there are people who already have worked with us who already validated us. So I'm telling that I'm a probate specialist to everyone. 
and I mean mostly to who this is going to be surprise. I'm making the most noise to investors because guess what's happening? Chad, if you're okay with me sharing, here's what has happened. Foreclosures got delayed. Uh, what do investors go after? Foreclosures have been put off every few months because of moratorium. So what are investors doing? By sitting in the investor group, this is my first and experience. This might be all speculation, but you guys can validate it for me. Investors are talking about going after divorce list, going after eviction list, and guess what? Probate list. So that's why there's more noise on the probate list. So if you can't fight from the front door, go from the back door and just ask investors, hey, who is the probate person you're talking to who is not willing to give you the property? Let me sell it because you now get referrals from investors. And that's how I'm getting my business too. When you, when you pick up a, a, a property, are you primarily selling those properties as a realtor or are you wholesaling them, flipping them? I'm open to all possibilities. For, for now, list it or buy it as a flip. Okay, sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, Rosie. Miss Donna, I know you had a question. You had reached out yesterday. How are you? Fine. I actually misread the time. I was thinking it was one o'clock my time. And so I like am in the car driving back home, but I'm um, also trying to invest now and also be a real estate agent. And I brought on two women that are actually going to team with me. And when you were in the mastery class, Chad, you talked about how you evolved into that. You would bring two contracts, if I remember right. And one was mm -hmm. a retail contract. This is what you would get. And this is what you would net if you did that or I could buy the property for this amount and this is what I would make on it. So you were disclosing it right up front and then you were, you would be, I don't know if you were wholesaling it or flipping it, what, you know, I guess probably different things, right? It didn't matter mm -hmm. what you did with it at that point. And you gave them the option. And I guess my questions are around as a realtor, how to do that ethically and also how to have partners involved in that and what's the most fair way to do that. Before I answer, a couple of little questions. So what is your business relationship? Are they profit sharing? Are you paying them per deal, per hour? Well, we're going to, we've done a lot of research. It looks like we need to do a C-Corp for each of us and then have a partnership agreement is what, I'm, I'm open for suggestions, but that's where we've evolved now. Is that not think, a good idea? I don't think you want a C-Corp. I mean, there's... I'm using a company called Anderson, which referred to us, who are also investors. And they're a whole team. They're attorneys tax advisors and business advisors and they are all investors themselves so they understand okay. it differently so that's well, what they suggested they may have some structure and john i saw your body language if you want to type pipe in please do that doesn't seem like the, I, I wouldn't do it that way but okay tell me how you would do it i i'm open. i want to hear just, john fraker tell you how he okay. thinks it should be done he okay. wants a law degree thanks chad yeah i actually like anderson i follow their stuff and watch their blog. Post yeah, they have else. great information. And I did a coaching call with them so far. So yeah, okay. I mean, I, I also wouldn't rule out finding somebody closer to your, you know, where you are personally to talk to you about your legal and tax stuff. They're really good. They're also a fortune if you want to use them. Like their whole legal package is like really expensive. And then you throw on the, the tax uh, prep work. So I'm not discouraging well, them. I mean, I, like I said, well, I, I like them a lot. Doing, I was considering doing the membership with them. Because for a flat amount and we get a discount because we're part of nice. REN, the Women's Networking Group. And then oh, it's nice. $35 a month. They've got unlimited access to their question, which we have had Legal Shield for 30 years. And mm -hmm. I use that all the time. It's an yep. awesome process where I can call. I, I can fill out the paperwork. They just tell me which one to fill out. I've done several legal things myself, doing it myself and done, been very effective. And then they have the tax advisor part too. I just know that when I talk to attorneys in the past, if they don't understand investing personally themselves, even if they're a real estate attorney, it's problematic because yep. there's caveats they don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what that's why I still recommend finding somebody in your market who does real estate investing and works with them just for your own. I mean, just for okay. your deals anyway. Okay. You know, when I invest and everything, I always run stuff through a local law firm anyway. You're going to need them, you know, in your arsenal, regardless right. of the, of the overall Arizona. stuff. I mean... As far as bringing on two different partners and things like that, I mean, the number one thing I tell people is clarify everybody's expectations. Right. I mean, all, all like 99% of the law is just reducing everybody's mental understanding of what's happening into writing right. so that everybody's on the same page. Right. right. Dis disagreements arise, but usually they arise because one person thinks they were promised this, person thinks they were promised that, and then right. they wind up in the courts to decide 
you know, what everybody meant when you could just clarify that up front. Right. And then two other ladies are, um, they're both, they don't have any real estate knowledge per se, except to owning their own property. So I'm coming to the table with most of the knowledge, but okay. one of them is really good at tech and that background. And the other one's more good in the finance. And so we thought we would conquer and divide kind of thing as, as well as the duties, because it's overwhelming running these lists and stuff and trying to get a hold of people and putting together campaigns so that they run and are consistent. And I'm used to that. I do all that. Well, I've done all hear, that. I've been in the business 20 years now. So I have a system. Go ahead. I want to hear your opinion, John, on, on the C-Corp structure for a small partnership like that. It seems unnecessary and more expensive and, and complicated to maintain. A C-Corporation has two levels of taxation, right? And sometimes right. that works to your favor. It's probably not. Right. In, a, in a small business, if, especially if you're wholesaling, like if you're getting hit with earned income tax rates, it's not going to be too favorable, Donna. You're likely to end up paying a lot more in taxes. Yep. Right. The main thing is when you're dealing with someone like Anderson, you need to understand why they're recommending it in your specific situation, not just okay. kind of overall in a seminar or YouTube video or whatever. I mean, they're great at, oh, right. at publishing content, probably one of the best in the industry but know why it's being recommended in, in your specific case, right? Okay. I, again, well, I, don't know, I don't know what relationship you are having with these other people. Is it per deal or is it overall ongoing business kind of thing, right? C corporations can be advantageous in certain circumstances, but you need to be clear on that. And they need to tell you why they're recommending a C corp for you in what you're trying to accomplish in this specific case. Does that make sense? I initially thought, I thought we would need one C corp for all of us. And then we would just have an agreement underneath. You had an LLC for every property. This is what I've been told by multiple people now. LLC for each home because you didn't, wouldn't want one for 10 homes because if one person sues you because they fell in their house, then they could sue you for all 10, right? So you'd want yep. it for each one. And then it basically, when you sell it, it goes with it or it dissolves. Was that true or no? I mean, it, it is true. It, a lot of it is you know, cost benefit, right? So when I talk LLCs with my real estate investor clients, I'm in California. So the, the downside of California investors is that they're going to hit you with $800 minimum franchise tax for every LLC. You have 10 flips, oh. you have $8,000 a year minimum just for that. Oh, so that yeah. doesn't become super popular with my clients. I'm pretty sure we don't have that here. It, no, it I don't think like anybody does outside of California. It doesn't mean that you need an LLC for every deal, right? Some right. people do one LLC and they do separate land trusts for each with the LLC is oh. the beneficial interest of the trust, right? Okay. There's that. And then there's also the, you know, putting two or three properties or two or three deals into one LLC. So you're not always having to reinvent the wheel and the corporate paperwork, et cetera, right? It's a fun. So I have a lot of right. buy and hold. I would say the majority of my clients are buy and hold long-term. Okay. And I say, look, if you have five single families, that's a different risk than if you have five multifamilies, right? Or one massive right. apartment. I have a lady who has a hundred, 150 unit apartment complex in Cincinnati. And, you know, that one gets its own firewall because obviously right. the liability from that sucker is tremendous, right? right? Single families, not always, right? I mean, always look at every deal, analyze it from all the different ways you can get sued. Obviously on the flip, there's, you know, different levels of liability. So right. whether or not you need a separate LLC for every single possible deal you could ever do, I don't right. know. That's expensive, you know, and time well, consuming. But. This is something that I really want someone who knows this to do it for me. To me, it's not my area of expertise and I don't want to figure it out. To be honest, I want to trust somebody that is, you know, I've, that's got credibility and I can do it myself. I did my own for my real estate business. It's not that difficult to set one up, but it's, it is with partners. Returns are also obnoxious. What I would recommend, I mean, and there's obviously, I mean, you've paid for their time and they've dug into it, but generally what I would recommend for most investors, at least in the beginning, if you don't already have a sizable portfolio, is just a simple LLC. And then each of the properties you roll into a land trust. Now, if you're financing these, sometimes banks don't like land trust. You can take title of the LLC and then, then roll it back out into a land trust. The reason for that is predominantly anonymity, but in certain states like in Virginia, I don't pay transfer taxes if I close it into a land trust versus closing it into my LLC. So I end up saving, it's a wash. Like I come out net positive because I have to pay 500 bucks to establish and record the trust, but that's cheaper than the transfer taxes. So okay. one is cost savings, two, it's anonymity. So if somebody does come to sue you, the, the plaintiff's attorney is going to go, okay, what assets does she have? And if they can't find any, then you don't have, it, it doesn't make much sense to sue you, right? So if you 
like that. What I would normally recommend for most people is a simple LLC with a rock solid operating agreement and your shares of that LLC are held by probably another LLC you buy yourself, you or you and your spouse. That way, okay. if anything, if anything ever does break out in a partnership, it, you still have your personal LLC is the one in that fight. So if you were ever sued as a partner, they would sue your LLC, not necessarily you personally. Now, they're likely to sue you personally too, but what your attorney is going to argue, no, 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 she was acting as Donna LLC as the part in this. Right. So right. it gives you, it's a simple structure. You solely have an LLC. That one's easy to establish. You don't usually okay. need an operating agreement to, unless you plan on suing yourself. The, the partnership LLC, you need to, to, as John said, you guys should sit around the table and literally get everything out on the table and pay a local attorney to draft an operating agreement that, that protects each of you and, and actually can like clearly in black and white says this is the intent of these people upon formation. Wow. Donna, are you part of a RIA group? And the what? RIA, Real the Estate Ari Investors. I actually joined the one here, Arizona. Real I just joined it, but I haven't been to a meeting yet, but I did join. Yes. Yeah. That's a great place to find attorneys who know what they're doing in real estate investments. Obviously, right. you know, never reinvent the wheel, right? You're not the first person right. to have these issues. So learn from the other investors in your market, who right. they use. And I mean, you can really get the inside skinny on what it's like to work with people by, okay, you know, talking to their clients saying, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? You know, do they understand well, what we're trying to accomplish? Right. So I, I Googled partnership agreements yesterday and I actually found one that had some pretty good structure in it, but I figured it still needed to be reviewed either way by an attorney. It was, looks like it was written by an attorney originally, but it didn't have some caveats in it that I know it needs to have, but it was a good start. I, I already told the girls, both of them, we need to have an attorney actually write up our partnership agreement. So you guys are calling it an operating agreement. Same would be the same thing, right? I mean, or is there a different terminology? It's mostly the same. For you're, a partnership LLC, it's, you, the terms are interchangeable. I wouldn't use anything off the internet. I had a client who hired us to do a corporation for them. And they booked the meeting and like showed up two days later. And like in between, they went to legal Zoom and paid them like 800 bucks. Tell yes. me, show me how big you're thinking in this partnership. Show me your vision. How big is it? Well, I personally want to own 10 properties that I own and keep, like rent. I would actually like to do it in the next year. I mean, I'm getting to be at an age where I'm going to be retiring. And I, I want to be able to, I literally had a vision. I had a dream the other night that we went in our travel trailer because we just got a travel trailer three years ago and we were traveling the country buying property, me and my husband. So I'm thinking big. I want it to be something we can do on the road or we could do here. You want good to own size. 10 properties free and clear. Why are you going down this road with partners? And, and how do you see that happening with two other people having 66% equity in, in the asset? My one of my best friend who's always been looking for something as well to do as a you know as a business that she can make money. She understands real estate because I talk to her about it all the time. The other one, I've known her for 35 years. Okay. And she's actually lives in California. The other one I met through the REN, the Women's Real Estate Investment Group. I met Invest Network. And I met her through that and we connected. She's here locally with me and she's looking for an exit strategy too to get out of a daily job too. And she's got a good business head on her. She's a life coach. So these, right? these sound so, like 1099 contractors to me, not partners. I don't know if they would see it that way. I mean, in their mind, they want, they, yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, I'm coming. Yeah, Bear with me one second. So let's okay. say it's 2024. The yeah. LLC has 10 houses. How do you get them to be your houses when you bought them with partners? You have okay. to finance them out. You either have to give them cash right. or you have to refi the assets. So it doesn't serve your long-term vision. Like your vision is Donna owns 10 houses. Bringing a partner into that puts you further from that goal and adds late, like multiples of complexity. So what I'm proposing is that you venture with these individuals. It can feel like a partnership. You can call it whatever you want. But from a legal right. standpoint, you have an LLC. That LLC is on contract. That LLC has a contract with them as 1099 contractors. And they uh, and their compensation uh -huh. is based on profit. So they can b benefit from the work that they do and get some profit. But ultimately, title is only held in your name because it's your big vision, right? And it sounds like you're bringing more to the table as far as the experience of how to build and manage that portfolio. Right. 
Rosie, you have. Well, uh, what if each one of those guys want to own their own tin, though? I mean, how does that? Can't we just have an LLC? Can't we work together on the lists and leads and the, and divide and conquer? I mean, Marty, that I guess maybe part of it too. Like just being really transparent. My worry is based on what I know. It seems like this, this is a relatively new relationship. You. But in the very beginning, you said, I'm the one with all the real estate experience, but these are good gals and they have business experience. And you started to justify right. that. So what yes. I see is you already, you've got some <laughs> doubt in there. You're trying, you're, you already don't know if this is right. But if you guys sit down as a team, the three of you and say, okay, we want to own 10 houses each. And we realize we get 33.33% of each one that we buy. I was, you know, we're going to do this forever. The, the biggest challenge with putting all this into one pot is going, you guys have to, and I'm going to say have to, unless you want to live some legal hell in the future, you have to have the exact same like strategy and me meaning like somebody can't just change their mind and decide they want to liquidate in two years because this is a long-term plan. You're, you have a long-term portfolio plan. They, if they're right. looking to make quick cash and change careers or put a kid through college and they need to liquidate assets, then it can completely screw up your entire finance strategy across the portfolio. And commercial lenders may not give you a partial release. They may not let you refund. You know, there, there's limitations that come with it. If they want to own 10 houses until they die and you want to, then it might make sense. But you've got to make sure that you guys are on the same page that they're in it for the long haul. Otherwise, you could be spending a lot of money up front to partner with people that you should have just joint ventured with to, to make some quick profits on deals. And I'll caution you to not feel like there's an extreme amount of urgency to have the partnership in place because you can underwrite these people by doing some joint ventures, right? So right. you guys can jump into a couple deals. You have your LLC, they have theirs. You do a joint venture agreement and let's try this out. Let's do a couple deals together. And, you know, you may even set a few, put a few tests in there to see what you can reveal about them. And okay, I, I would just caution you before you pay a legal firm a lot of money to write up a very complex corporate structure, make sure that this is, it, it's what serves your long, your long-term view, like your vision. Because if you want to hold these out, for example, like a good friend of mine, Nigel, he's, he controls probably 650, 700 doors. He will never, ever sell a piece of real estate. It's just, it, it is not in his fabric. His dad thought <laughs> that years ago, you don't sell real estate. You buy real estate. You pay for it. You get it paid off and you hold it forever. Even if the damn thing's running in the ground, like you right. use cash flow to rebuild it. So if that's your view, then you, like people with that, that, if that's your strategy, if it's a true long-term buy and hold, it's bad news to partner with somebody who's been wholesaling and they're used to quick, you know, quick shots of revenue and paying high taxes on that. It's a whole different strategy. So make sure you guys, I hope you've already had a lot of those conversations of, you know, what do you, why do you want to do this? What are you going to do with the money? Are you a credit partner? If, because if they're going to be a partner and split equity, they should be willing to be a credit partner as well, right? Like you can borrow off of their name and they assign a personal guarantee and like that shared risk. If they're like, they're, they should be bringing a lot of benefit to the table. So it's a big decision and big conversations. A lot of folks jump into partnerships taking it too lightly you get 20 okay. or 30 houses in an llc you've got a lot of stress on your hands figuring out how to get one person out whether they want to be out or not it can get really complicated because of your if you're using leverage especially because then the bank has a say in it too right right so just be really clear on your strategy now all that can i ask a really one question so with with you saying doing a, a few deals together that's actually initially what i was thinking but i was thinking all everybody's saying we need to do all this legal stuff and i don't want to i don't i want to make sure we're protected right so how would that what would that look like we just have it like written on a napkin that we're like going to split everything a third or what would it look um, like i mean do you have an llc i have a PLLC for my real estate business my name no, for you're, as, not gonna, you're not going to co-mingle your brokerage activity with your investment right activity. right so i have to have another so i haven't done anything yet because i 
I've been advised so many different directions to Sunday. I don't know which way to go right now. So yeah. get an entity for yourself. Probably just a simple Arizona LLC. And okay. I think your I think your annual maintenance is like fifty bucks in Arizona. Right. right? So yeah. you're it's a single member LLC. It's a pass through. You'll it'll come through on your taxes as a Schedule C, and you don't really need an operating agreement. You can do that today and have a legal entity with an EIN number. Go get a bank account for that. Set up your checking account and just have that ready. They should okay. also do the same. And this is one of those tests that I was telling you about, right? If okay. this person is partnership, then you're going to say, all right, guys, listen, there's, there are several ways we can do this. Each of them is, it's probably going to cost us between five and $10,000 to set up a fully structured entity that would protect us all and be a good long-term entity. If you're working with that level of attorney, that's probably not that far off. I mean, I, you can burn up five grand pretty quickly just writing an operating agreement. So just use that as the excuse. You know, listen, it's, we're going to have to invest a considerable amount of money just in the setup. So let's first make sure we know exactly what structure we need. If you guys can go set up your own single member LLCs, I've already set up mine. Here's a joint venture agreement that we'll actually use and we'll do one for each deal. So you sign the contract as Donna LLC and or a sign that contract, uh, you know, and then you have a, a, a one, two, three Walnut Street. And then you guys have a joint venture agreement and you could base it on time or you could base it on property address, you know, but show them like, Hey, listen, I'm willing to split everything three ways. I'm just not, I don't know what, I don't know what to tell the attorneys to write up just yet. So let's do a couple of deals, but you can do a simple joint venture agreement. That between where do you your get, where do you get, where do you get that? You should get it from a local attorney and John gave you great advice. Meet that attorney at the okay. real estate investor. The meeting next week. Okay. Let Go through their list of resources on their, every RIA has their list of attorneys okay. or, a mess, or a message board. Call some of the other realtors and get their input. People who are okay. very successful, people who are where you want to be. In, okay. in general, I, I mean, in, I'm in complete agreement with the chat as far as everything you said about putting people in equity position in your company. I tell people that like, 20 plus years of advice. If the person that you want to give equity to, if they leave your company and your company implodes, you give them equity. Anything else, you find something else, some other way of compensating them, some other way of structuring a deal. The entire corporation's code in California and literally every state is designed to protect minority shareholders, people who own less than 50%. So okay. if you're not great at keeping records and holding meetings and minutes, and observing the minutia of the corporate code, a minority partner could use that to just hammer you in court because the entire court system is designed to protect people who can't protect themselves in the corporate structure. Right. So okay. all that stuff that like you don't really need to worry about too much in your LLC when it's just you becomes okay. really important when you're trying to solve that in front of a judge. Okay. And how much would an operating agreement typically think cost us to do? Do I have an idea? Do you have any idea? For the three of you? Yes. You should budget at least $5,000 because you're going to have to address like what happens during death, what happens during dissolution, what happens if a member wants to transfer, you know, that are new members allowed in? Can they sell their shares? Do you have a right of first refusal? Like you guys have a lot of discussion. I'll tell you the difference. Even if we're just going to do a couple deals first, like yes. you said? It's like getting married before you go on a first date, right? Like, it's <laughs> like, well, can't we just sign the marriage license? I mean, it'll probably work out. If you're just going to do a couple of deals, it's going to cost you 150 bucks to file an LLC. It'll cost you maybe $200 in an attorney's time to share a joint venture agreement. You can probably okay. just get that from the document library from your RIA. A lot of them actually have an attorney on retainer for the RIA that actually provides state contracts, leases, JV agreements, okay. wholesale, wholesale purchase agreements. So okay. you can probably just grab that from their resource center. Kind of a test with a couple of deals. Okay. Yeah. And if they can't set up their own LLC and sign the joint venture agreement and like meet you at least then a they're third not, of the way. Right. That's a pretty good first test, right? Can't show up on, can't show up on time for the first date. The marriage is probably going to suck. Right. But I would suggest if you can do a couple of different types of deals. So you have to go through the management discussion. Okay. Well, now we have this house, one, two, three, Walnut street. We're going to put 35,000 into it. Who's going to manage it? Now you're having real conversations, right? And you're going to learn a ton about these people just in these first few deals. 
and see uh, if they step up and actually earn their 33%. One of the biggest mistakes you could ever make in a partnership is just arbitrarily saying, okay, 33 for me, 33 for you, 33 for you. You've got to look at what is being done? Who is doing that work? My strong suggestion here is find a way to work with these folks as 1099 employees or joint venture okay. partners, because it's expensive to set up a good partnership structure. And it's really damn expensive to get yourself out of one that was poorly structured. So one of them, for instance, I think has more um, available finances. So maybe let them be a private lender for the deals and make the 10 to 12% or something like that. Well, okay. you can make them, they can be a joint venture partner and the lender, right? There's two agreements oh. there. Okay. They're, they're a profit share on the joint venture because you're wanting okay. to, you're wanting to build goodwill with them, right? Hey, listen, I think I want to be your business partner. So here's your joint venture agreement. And by the way, if you want to be the lender on this one, you're going to make it, you're going to make more money than we will, but you're also taking right. more risk. So then right. you have a, a note and a deed of trust. So they actually would have, you know, they would be papered in the deal two different ways as the lender and as a joint venture partner. And then your joint venture agreement, if you're going to do that on a long-term buy, and it needs to say, you know, here's the, the distribution allocation, you know, it needs to be a, a, a table of percentage interest table. If okay. she's a 35% partner, she gets 35% of all distributions. Right? right. So that's, I've got a hard stop in six minutes, but I, I don't want to okay. like, let's assume all that's in place. You guys know what you're doing. You're out there looking for, looking at houses, right? Going on. A, uh -huh. There's a couple ways you can do this. So you're predominantly playing the brokerage role. Is that right? Right. But I'm, I have my license. That's a question too. I have my license hung. I have a request to meet with the actual designated broker to go over this to see, because I've heard rumors and been told by some of the other brokers that I wouldn't be able to do it at all. And then I was advised yesterday by a guy who works out of Prescott who does this all day long. And he actually started his own brokerage. And he said, if I was just my own broker, because I have a problem with wanting to handle all that paperwork for a brokerage. But he says, if it's just your own deals and you really don't have any other agents, there won't be a lot. It'll just be your normal record. You just keep, you, don't, you always keep it. You don't need it. to be a broker. It's, it's a whole lot oh. of expense and pain in the butt. Good. I don't, if you I don't, don't want to be a broker. Then just accept that as, as the truth. Like Donna's not a broker. And I've, people have asked me for years, I'm not a broker. I'm like, I'm smarter than that. Like I don't recruit agents. I know that a lot of people do, but it's not who I am. So it makes zero sense for me to be a broker because I assume more liability, more cost, more, more continuing ed, all that stuff. I have an amazing broker and she's cool with me doing what I do and I can do it under her, you know, her license. So right. if you feel the same way, if you're not going to go recruit and build downlines and, you know, build an agency, it's probably not the smartest thing for you to do. Have you watched the interview that I did with Chris Prefontaine a few weeks ago. No. So Chris and I had this conversation. He was a, a broker owner for 15 years. He's now a, a coach and a course creator in, in the creative finance space on terms. Okay. He wrote he wrote real estate on your terms. He's got the like the QLS system, like his creative financing course. We had okay. this conversation on one of the, the blog, one of the podcasts we did here recently, and we'll get you okay. a link to it. Okay. But he ended up, so we, in that conversation, we agree, if your broker, is, if you have clearly contained your investment activity, so what I mean by that is you have an LLC for any investment activity. That LLC has an EIN number, it has a bank account, it has its own credit cards, and you're not commingling funds between the entity. There is a clear divide between Donna as a person, Donna as a brokerage entity, and Donna as an investment entity. There's This is clear, it's black and white. You've done the work to structure it. If your broker is afraid of that and tells you that's illegal, you have the wrong fucking broker. And it's, there's just no other way to put it. And we had this conversation. I had to go through dozens of brokers before I found one. And the attorneys would agree with me. They're like, no, dude, you're good. Like your structure is good. Right. Brokers were like, nope, he's, he's wrong. He's wrong. It's, that's fucking illegal. You're going right. to And I go back to the attorney. I'm like, he scared the shit out of me. Is this really wrong? And he's like, oh, right. you're good. But eventually when you walk into the right broker's office, they're like, oh, that's amazing. Can you teach my agents how to do lease options? Or can you bring, you know, because they right. realize so First off, make sure you're structured properly. If you have a broker that's inhibiting you from doing investment activity in an investment company, again, from a legal standpoint, LLCs are treated as people, right or wrong? Right. Right. Yeah. So we're not talking about Donna. We're talking about ABC LLC. 
So that LLC does not hold a real estate license. That LLC does not eat dinner with my kids. That LLC <laughs> holds my houses, right? I'm sitting here as Donna Brokerage Entity, which is under your brokerage license. It doesn't eat dinner with me either. Like it's not at my house in the evening. You know, there's boundaries. There are clear legal boundaries to this. So if you are not commingling funds, if you're not distributing, you know, if you're not pumping money, if, if you're using sound business practices, right. you are not violating anything. And I would suggest that you have an entity for your investment activity. And if you're doing enough volume, an entity, or so, if you're not doing a whole lot of volume, a sole proprietorship, but an entity is even better, like an LLC for the brokerage activity. And then you have you and you've got E&O insurance on your brokerage activity. You've got a, you know, a liability policy on your investment entity. You've got an, a personal umbrella policy across all of that. And I've got to run, but if you're thinking really big and we can pick up and finish this, if you're thinking really big and I don't, I'm trying to decide if I even say this right now, cause I don't want you to, I don't want to <laughs> overwhelm you even more, but potentially if say you're it. thinking big and you're looking at building long-term wealth in a portfolio, you should be looking at, at spending that kind of money, investing in things like either a domestic or a foreign asset protection trust, where you build a real container to, to, to isolate risk. And if, if you're building that portfolio and there's a structure in, in Arizona, actually, where you set up an Arizona limited partnership that holds the LLC, that holds the assets, that limited partnership has a bridge that goes to a Belize trust with a Cook Island successor trustee. And that's like your ultimate safety plan. And <laughs> if you're thinking big and it's not that expensive, it's, I mean, this is something that family offices and billionaires are doing, but it's not that expensive. But if you're thinking, all right, we're going to amass, you know, millions and millions of dollars of real estate, then all this other stuff is, I can, show. there's ways to accomplish a much, the ultimate level of legal protection for not a hell of a lot more money than some of the things we've talked about here. I, like, I think you should go do a couple of JV deals with these guys. Meet that local attorney right. at the RIA. Okay. JV, get to know the people. Come back next week and let's talk about how you guys can interact in the appointment. Because there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can go as the wearing your brokerage hat. And then if you can't get, you know, then you can mention my cash buyers and you can deliver the offer on their behalf. Or... If they're good in person, you can bring them along as the bad cop just in case. Hey, you know, when we meet on Wednesday, I, what I'd like to do is go ahead and bring one of my investor buyers so she can actually get a look at the place. I'll make sure she's not there longer than 15 minutes. Would that be okay? You bring her along on the appointment. The, the biggest, the, the easiest way to shut down a seller is, is when you make that cash offer and they flinch. Sometimes they lock up and they just, they're not, they don't hear another thing you say, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to allow her as the investor to, we're going to play a little bit good cop, bad cop. So she'll walk through the house, do a scope of repairs, come up with some back of the napkin figures and be like, hey, Donna, I, in front of the seller. And I, I think I, I'm going to be somewhere around, you know, probably 150 on this one. Uh, just let me know. And then she gets the hell out of there. Now you are the good. So if they flinch and be like, who does that bitch think she is coming in here off? Now, hey, hey, listen, then you can play the good cop and you can smooth that over and still have a brokerage conversation. So there's a really right. effective way to do this. David Pinnell's done this. Like he, he and Liz have done this too. But you can go as a pair knowing that gives you more negotiation tactics in, in your toolbox. Or you can go individually and someone, whoever the strongest front person is, knows what the most likely acquisition and disposition strategy is. And you either get right. it or you don't. Well, I also have to figure out the structure of if I ended up retelling it, right, at all, if that happens, then what does that look like? Do I, one of the, my friends, we came up with an idea that I put a percentage in the pot for the, comp, the business because it, the marketing and stuff that we did together help get that trends, you know, that, that inter interview basically. And then the rest is mine, you know, cause I, either way I'm going to have to pay brokerage fees, which is not much. I only pay three fifty per transaction. So with, you know, and everything, so it's really reasonable, but, but you know, what does that look like? Because I'm not going to walk away from it completely. If I can retail it, you know what I mean? If I can put it on the open market as a listing, I'm not going to stop. I'm not, that would be ridiculous. I am a realtor. You know, so. what I would say on, in a scenario like that, be sure and really start to picture these boxes, like Donna, the person, Donna, the broker, Donna, the investor. In right. that scenario, Donna, the, the broker wants the listing that 
basically was referred to you by Donna, the LLC, the, the partnership member, right? Right. So you as a broker could pay a marketing fee to the LLC that you're a partner in. Now okay. you're entitled to 33.3% of that if you're an equal partner in it, but really think about how separate these things are and it'll help you understand how to fairly structure these things and, and make sure everybody else is also has okay. that kind of cognitive map of what your structure is. Right. Um, I got it. Okay. Awesome. Run, there's a lot I know. More, a lot more than I, I know. I told through. you, that's why I said to you, can I talk to you? Cause I'm like really confused about what I'm seeing. I'm just hearing so many yeah. different but things and now, I just don't between know. Between now and next week, you guys aren't likely to be going on appointments together. So that's why I'm willing to park that part of the conversation for a bit. What yeah. I want you to do is get together with them in person and get some, get some start getting this out on the table and be like, listen, you know, I've talked to some high level attorneys. It's probably going to cost us, you know, a considerable amount of money to draft a partnership, you know, a true operating agreement that would be safe right. for us and our families. But today I just wanted to have a cocktail and talk about what exactly all the ways we can make money what our right. long term long term plans are as humans, like as people, not as partners. Right. And really just make sure we're on the same page because you know, I've talked to some really smart dudes that have had partnerships and really warned that the partnership is only the right structure in a very small set of, of circumstances. Usually there's a right. better structure. And I think what you'll find is you guys can get along harmoniously and, and make good money, but you don't have to be on the same operating agreement. Okay, and that sounds the other thing to consider, Donna, 54 per 53 plus percent of people go through divorce and most of them don't have asset protection plans. Those things can spill over into your partnership. So okay. just keep in mind it's bigger than the three of you. It's their right. kids, it's, it's their estate, it's their marriage. You got to know that these are people you can right. trust that have the same values as you or is the easiest way. Exactly. Do it this other way where they can still make money. Like you just said, is it really more about the money flow that they can make? And does it matter what's how we structure it? You know what I mean? As a partnership versus just a, like a, you said, a joint venture or something like that. So that's a yep. good way to think about it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so All right. much. Please come back next week. Let's keep this conversation going. And to okay. everybody else, thank you for contributing. John, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you John, thank you. Allowing us to bounce things off of you. Sure. Dave Gwen, I didn't get to you. Thank come back you. next week, man. I got to hear how you're doing. All right. Thanks so thank much, you. guys.